Good morning and welcome to the Leaders Brief by Egomonk. Today we take a look at what is being seen as a Polish decision against women's rights as Warsaw decides to opt out of the Istanbul Convention. Examine increasing tensions between Sudan, Egypt and Ethiopia over the sharing of Nile waters and consider what Auckland's algorithm charter for government agencies mean. Basically, the convention is there to protect all women from violence of all kinds, violence to which they are subjected largely because they are women or to which women or by which women are disproportionately affected. So it covers, of course, issues of violence like rape. Clearly, that is a crime which is a perpetrated on women more than on men. Uh, it also covers female genital mutilation, which is clearly a crime which only women are subjected to. But in addition, issues like domestic violence, whether that be physical or sexual violence within the home, is suffered far more by women than by men. And that's why the Convention is there in order to protect women in all their aspects of life, whether it be in the home, in the workplace, on the street, uh, wherever it may be, protect them from the violence to which they are subjected. That was Bridget O'Lawlin from the Council of Europe outlining the Council of Europe Convention on Preventing and Combating Violence Against Women and Domestic Violence, popularly called the Istanbul Convention, a European pact that the newly re-elected Polish right-wing government has decided to pull out of. Poland's Justice Minister Zbigniew Ziobro justified Warsaw's move by claiming that the resolution violates the rights of parents by requiring schools to teach about gender. Ziobro had previously criticized the resolution by calling it a feminist invention to justify gay ideology. These were chants from anti-LGBTQ protesters at a Pride March in Poland last year, forcing police to intervene and assert force to bring the situation under control. Poland has seen global criticism for quite some time now for its conservative views about homosexuality and gender identities. The recent victory of the Andrzej Duda-led Nationalist Law and Justice Party meant more strains on the EU-Poland relationship due to Warsaw's controversial reforms to its judiciary and constant opposition of gay rights. In fact, President Duda had called LGBTQ rights as an ideology more dangerous than communism. Now the Polish Justice Minister's initiation to withdraw from the Istanbul Convention has led to a new wave of protests questioning the government. Notably, this year Duda was re-elected by a narrow margin of 2%, suggesting that the Nationalist Law and Justice Party's popularity is losing favour among Polish residents. Poland has stated that they are in support of protecting women from all sorts of domestic violence, but the convention acts as an ideological tool towards normalizing LGBTQ rights. Ziobro said that Poland's laws are enough to safeguard women. Poland is not the only country against the resolution. Slovakia and Bulgaria had refused to ratify it, stating that it undermines traditional family values. In Africa, Egypt, Sudan and Ethiopia have locked horns once again over the sharing of the Nile waters. The matter on which I am addressing you today is of the greatest consequence to the Egyptian people and requires, like our efforts to combat this global pandemic, a commitment to uphold the spirit of cooperation and to recognize that no nation is an island unto itself. That was Egyptian diplomat Shami Sokri talking at a United Nations meeting last year. However, despite Sudan and Egypt's concerns, Ethiopia has started filling a reservoir it has built on the Blue Nile, the largest of the Nile's three tributaries. The water-sharing dispute between the three African countries spans nearly a decade ever since Ethiopia started construction of the $4.6 billion Grand Ethiopian Renaissance Dam to meet its energy needs. Despite being one of the fastest growing economies in the world, over 70% of Ethiopians are not connected to the national power grid, a problem that the dam seeks to remedy. Built over an area of 1,840 square kilometer, the GERD is expected to produce over 6,000 megawatts of power, enough to electrify the entire country and supply excess power to immediate neighbors. Ethiopia, which has recently finished the first phase of filling the dam, said that it will continue filling the reservoir through the rainy season irrespective of whether an agreement is reached with Egypt and Sudan or not. The dam is expected to make a significant impact on both these countries as 93% of Egypt's and 77% of Sudan's freshwater requirements are met by the Nile. Ethiopia had earlier rejected a UN proposition to intervene in the matter, saying that dispute resolution should only come from regional players. However, all previous attempts at reaching an agreement between the countries have failed. 
Egypt has also indicated that Ethiopia's recent actions may incite Cairo to use military force to resolve the dispute. But in the last few years, containing several insurgencies, Ethiopia has formed a formidable army and Cairo will have to reconsider its war threats. For now, both Egypt and Sudan can only hope for an arrangement with Ethiopia to allow a certain amount of Nile water into the countries and develop alternate ways of water consumption. Recently, New Zealand became the first country in the world to formulate a standard-setting framework on the use of algorithms by government agencies. The Algorithm Charter for Aotearoa New Zealand aims at improving data transparency and ensuring its ethical use. This is how Mark Soden, government statistician, chief data steward and chief executive of Stats New Zealand describes the attempt. Because of the growing use of algorithms and service delivery to New Zealanders, in 2018, the government undertook a review of how algorithms are used across government in terms of delivering services to New Zealanders, focusing on a review of how 14 of our biggest data agencies use algorithms. We chose the algorithms which inform significant decisions and assess them against six principles for the safe and effective use of data, which we developed with the New Zealand Privacy Commissioner. The result was the Algorithm Assessment Report, which was aimed to provide New Zealanders with an understanding of how algorithms are and aren't used in decision making and what safeguards there are around the data and the ethics associated with algorithms. What the report found was that there's a range of really good safeguards in place, but that we could do more still in terms of including the views of New Zealanders um, in the development of those algorithms and how they're used. Effectively, we could do more in terms of transparency and accountability. The Charter, signed by 21 agencies till now, commits to several measures like telling people how algorithms are used, ensuring privacy and safeguarding human rights. A first of its kind, New Zealand's adoption of the Charter is likely to set a global example for countries struggling to safeguard data privacy laws. That is all for today. Tune in to Egomong to stay updated on the latest happenings and the impact on global trade, technology and innovation. Egomong helps you make sense of change. We are a global intelligence platform delivering asymmetric outcomes by bringing organizations closer to the communities they want to serve and the leaders they wish to influence. Visit our website insights.egomong.com that is i-n-s-i-g-h-t-s dot e-g-o-m-o-n-k dot com to subscribe and make better and faster decisions today. If you wish to collaborate with us, then please email us at contact at egomong.com. Mm -hmm.